I'm Marty Stauffer. Above the Arctic Circle, winter has fallen. For two months, the sun will neither rise nor set. Eskimos have lived here on the edge of the polar ice for centuries. Many hours are passed in listening to tales of great adventure. The Eskimo elder has spent a lifetime as a hunter in the Arctic. He talks to the animals, telepathically calling them, asking them reverently to give themselves to him. Over 70 times he has spoken to Nanook, the polar bear, and 70 times the great bear has answered. From Nanook, the people learned how to stalk the seal and the walrus. The polar bear looms large in the mythology of the Arctic people. In ancient times, Eskimos who feasted on its rich red meat believed they would be infused with its legendary courage. The hunter abstains from any killing for five days. This allows the bear's spirit to leave her body and return in the form of a newborn bear, a new queen of the ice. It's now March. Although temperatures hover at 20 below, spring is just around the corner. For the highly adapted animals of this white wilderness, the signs of the season are unmistakable. A female polar bear has emerged from her maternity den for the first time since November. Inside the snow cave, a trio of cubs were born in the dead of the Arctic winter. Three months later, the baby bears have begun to venture into the outside world. At birth, the cubs were blind and deaf, and small almost beyond belief. They weighed about one pound. Within a month, they quadrupled their size nourished on milk that is not only the richest among bears, but 10 times higher in fat and protein than a human. Now the two larger cubs weigh around 20 pounds, but their tiny sibling is what polar bear experts call an underbear. In a harsh land, this little one has almost no chance to survive. Our queen has already left her maternity ice cave with twins. After being sealed up for five months, living off her stored body fat, she is lean and hungry. The triplets are too busy to take much notice. If the cubs reach adulthood, 
they will be able to amble across the ice for hours on end and travel as far as a thousand miles in a month. For now, crawling the few yards back uphill to the den is a major trek. Eskimos call a bear cub that has left the den Atertak, one who goes to the sea. And that's just where our queen intends to take her twins, her young prince and princess. Within three days, the triplets will be forced to abandon the only home they've ever known. They'll also follow their mother to the kingdom of the pack ice. Our bear, mother of the twins, is characteristically cautious. She can smell a meal 20 miles away. The scent of other bears within a half mile must be overpowering. She decides to bypass the den site and the possibility of a confrontation. Male bears have been known to kill cubs, although there is disagreement about how common this is. A female bear could also pose a threat. The cubs follow as best they can, avoiding the crater-like holes made by mother's enormous feet. In the finely spun web of polar life, the cubs' arrival on the ice coincides with the birth of baby seals. The white-coated seal pups are a polar bear delicacy. The queen has lost about half her body weight since last autumn, and she is ready to eat. If the youngsters can make it through their first year, and about half do, their chances to survive increase dramatically. It's May, and endless shades of white contrast with an intense blue sky. The largest predator on Earth is going hunting. She leaves her cubs close by, in the safety of an ice playpen. A scent arouses her curiosity. The birthing lair of a seal underneath a mound of snow is a good place to find a helpless pup too young to swim. But the season for white coats has passed, and this is no seal pup. Like the bear, an ermine is also out hunting. 
Defying the odds, it takes the offensive. Not a wise move on the part of this frisky four ounce hors d'oeuvre. Though it hardly seems worth the effort, polar bears often hunt even smaller prey, like two ounce lemmings. Score one for the weasel. She sets out after larger quarry. Her cubs have grown into 40 pound balls of energy. Too noisy and uncoordinated just yet for the hunt. They seem interested in only one thing, fun. Meanwhile, Mother Bear is heading for the edge of the melting ice. As the pack splits, ice rafts are created where bearded seals congregate. The odor from their breath and their bodies is something even a dull-nosed human can smell at a distance. To a polar bear, it must be like following a familiar, well-marked street. The female submerges for an underwater approach to the edge of an ice pan. Eskimos believe that a seal is doomed if it lets a polar bear get within 50 feet. With cat-like quickness, a bear kills its prey, using a powerful paw like a sledgehammer. She gorges on high calorie skin and blubber before opening the body cavity. As yearlings, the cubs will shadow their mothers every move. But for now, they can only watch and wait for leftovers. May literally melts into June with its days of endless sunshine. Cubs are playful and curious, traits that are highly developed in intelligent animals like bears. This thousand pound female walrus may be a royal subject, but 
she's not quite ready to vacate her resting place to a precocious 50-pound cub. Before baby bear gets into real trouble, mama bear comes to the rescue. The twins are becoming strong swimmers. As adults, they will be able to swim 100 miles nonstop. By July, Arctic areas are almost ice free. Even eider ducks are fair game for polar bears now, as the birds congregate along the rocky coast. Eiders are insulated from the cold by dense down over a thick layer of fat. Some of the warmest sleeping bags in the world are filled with eider down. As summer heats up, they take to the water, more to cool off than to hunt. A polar bear has been known to catch a swimming seal, but it's rare. Still, the curious cub can hope. Every so often, the female takes a look below. Polar bears can dive to depths of 30 feet to hunt for prey. Movement attracts her attention. Closer inspection reveals the ghoulish face of a six foot long wolf fish. Formidable tusk-like teeth and powerful jaws for feeding on shellfish seem to discourage the hungry bear. Nearby, gannets soar on long, narrow wings above an inaccessible rookery. While patrolling the shoreline for food, our matriarch keeps a sharp eye on her playful offspring. brief Arctic summer is now coming to an end, and with it, the solitary time the family of three will spend together. It's October, and ice will soon form. The royal family is traveling to a point that juts out into the water where the ice forms first. Their journey will bring them into dangerously close contact with other bears. Big males stalk the point. She takes no chances, challenging even sub-adults who get too close to the cubs. The bears have eaten very little in the past few months. They seem impatient for freeze up when they can again hunt seals on the pack ice. Strangely, their fur has little insulation value. A thick layer of blubber under the skin keeps them warm. Even so, they fastidiously dry and groom their short coats 
by rolling on the ice. Other North American bears have longer, thicker coats. Only the polar bear has hollow hairs, which filter ultraviolet light to its black skin, where the rays are absorbed as heat. Huge, hairy feet serve as skid-proof snowshoes. The bears make daily treks to the sea, checking on the progress of the polar pack. Along the way, many stop to snack on kelp. Even this most carnivorous of bears eats plants from time to time. There is some dispute about how nutritious kelp may be. Humans use it as a salt substitute and a mineral and vitamin supplement. It is undeniably a rich source of iodine for the polar bears. The ever-present Arctic foxes follow. The waiting bears dig beds in the snow to protect themselves from 100 mile per hour winds which batter the cape. Nearby are other royal subjects, muskoxen, known as Umingmak to the Arctic people. Their foot-thick coats, the warmest on Earth, protect these Ice Age relics from any storm. Queen Bear and the twins prepare for the Arctic blast to come. Although it is rare for polar bears to kill musk oxen, the herd takes no chances. Less than 10 inches of snow falls here in a typical winter. Unless it crusts into hard pack, ungulates like the Peary's caribou can easily dig through. Meanwhile, bears take turns testing the thickness of the ice. The huge size of their feet allows them to walk on ice only inches thick. But the surface is still slushy in places, so the vigil on the cape continues. Once thought to be unsociable nomads of the ice, polar bears are now known to enjoy each other's company. Sometimes the same two bears will pair up in autumn, year after year.
As this female and her cub move toward the pack ice, an aggressive male blocks their way. Although he could kill the mother bear, he would run the risk of injury to himself. And any injury in this extreme wilderness could be a death sentence. The male knows the female will fight ferociously to protect her cub, and so he retreats. Not far away, our royal family sees another huge male approaching. The obedient cubs watch and store this learning experience in their memory banks. Of all animals in the Arctic, none is more admired by the native people. To appease the soul of a slain bear, they place its skull on the ice with its eyes facing inland. To do so ensures that its honored spirit will escape to find a home in a white bear yet unborn. Once the ice is heard to crack, the Eskimo hunters rest easy, knowing the soul has found a home, perhaps in the mythical village of spirit bears and in a new queen of the ice. In recent years, thousands of people have spent millions of dollars visiting polar bears in their Arctic home. As the popularity of ecotourism rises, polar bears will continue to be more and more valuable. I hope we can always trek to the frozen north and experience the thrill of seeing the ultimate example of motherly devotion, the queen of the ice. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.